This week we ask, how can I experience real freedom and all that is good? Welcome to Harbour Church. So glad that you've joined us today, whether this is your first time or you've been joining us many times uh, over this period of time particularly. If this is your first time of connecting with us then uh, I'd love for you to join us uh, or to find out more about what's going on to keep connected in with a visit to our website. Uh, click on the new here button and we'll send you all the information about what's going on. It's been over a year that we've been meeting just virtually online and very soon we'll be holding our first gathering and there's all the information about how you can book to join us in person uh, on the website. In our talk with this week we'll be exploring the issue of freedom. How can we experience real freedom? And our guest speaker Pastor Mark Chenery of Queensbury Life Church in Bradford is going to explain to us something about the nature that freedom comes not from the absence of something but from the presence of someone. So we'll explore a little bit more of that later. At the end of the service, we've got a special song that's been put together by churches across the world, released this week. And for some of you, there's bits of it that may be familiar. Um, it's blessed me so much this week. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, but first of all, we're going to pray. Father God, I thank you for your goodness towards us. I thank you for your care and your love for us. Lord, I pray that we may know what it is to truly live in freedom, freedom from uh, guilt, shame and sin, freedom from oppression, freedom from things that would come against us and to live in the freedom of the knowledge that you love us and care for us. Lord, we pray for our community, pray for, for people to encounter you and experience real freedom and pray for our nation uh, and all that's going on currently. We ask for your blessing and your protection in the amazing name that is Jesus. We'd love it if you like our video, press the thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, or make a comment. All of those things increase our visibility and enable us to share the good news of Jesus with more people. It's amazing how effective that is. If you'd like to join us in person as we come together, our first gathering for over a year is next Sunday, 16th of May, and there is space available in our 3.30 uh, time together uh, because of the COVID rules, we need to know who's coming and make sure that we we can uh, accommodate people. And there's very quest, various questions that have to be answered. So please visit our website, click on the button in-person gathering, and you will be able to uh, book your space, book your seat. Really look forward to seeing you. Coming up shortly, we've got the talk, uh, exploring the issues of freedom. Uh, but first, we're joining our friends from Soul Survivor Watford for worship.
Hi there, and uh, can I just say what a great privilege and pleasure it is to be sharing God's Word with you today. Um, so my greetings to you all. We're going to dive straight into God's Word, if that's okay. I'm going to be reading a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is where we'll spend some of our thoughts today. Start at verse 13. It says, We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. Amen. So here we are, um, another Sunday in lockdown. Another Sunday in lockdown. And, uh, you know, I guess the church is on a similar road to that that Saul of Tarsus was on when he had his conversion. That is the road to Damascus. Demascus. Never mind, never mind. Um, some people have said that the church has been wearing masks for years. We, we're longing to have those days when we can worship together and get rid of the masks. Um, but some of us have been wearing masks for years. It's nothing new with COVID. It's not just about stopping the virus. But people often wear masks. I think we wear masks in church because often we feel um, a pressure we feel a sense that we ought to be uh, wiser, that we perhaps ought to be more gifted, more um, more spiritual, more holy. Um, all of those things, kind of a pressure to be more than we really are. And so we find the easiest way to cope with that is to kind of hide behind things, to put on some kind of a, a mask, to pretend to be something or somebody that we're not. Now, that's not just new. That's not just only in the church, but that's true of all of mankind. 
We see right back in the Garden of Eden, um, when God first made the world and created Adam and Eve, there was a rebellion by Adam and Eve. They ate from that tree that they weren't meant to eat from. And so we find in the story of the Garden of Eden that they were hiding their rebellion. We find them hiding from God. They were, they were, they were hiding because of their, their guilt and their shame. And in fact, a good part of the Genesis story is, is all about their nakedness. The fact that they felt vulnerable, that they were, that God could see them for exactly what they were and they didn't like that. There was a sense of guilt and of shame. Adam and Eve were unable to keep God's one command. They were unable to trust God for that one thing. And that's a pattern that continues throughout the Bible. You see, after Adam and Eve and and uh, the separation that came from Adam and Eve as they were thrown out of the garden and their rebellion that led to, to death entering in the world, then God began again with a new family through Abraham and a nation that would be his own people called the Israelites. And this time they didn't just get one commandment, but they got lots of commandments. God gave the commandments through Moses. And every time God uh, and Moses would meet, God would give Moses some commandments and Moses would relay those commands to the Israelites. And uh, as he did that, his face would shine from spending time in God's presence, from sharing the wonderful revelation of God's commandments. His face would be radiant and would be shining. And then he would put a cover over his face. He'd put a mask on, a veil on, because that radiance would start to diminish. That glory would start to dissipate because it was laws that were never meant to be of lasting glory but they were only of a temporary nature and so the glory that they came with the radiance the shining of Moses face would also diminish but Moses hid that from the people by putting on a veil and a mask and so the Israelites got these new commands but they would continually sin and that pattern of God's commandments and of breaking them continues all through the Bible, all through mankind, all through the generations, right down to you and I, who also break God's laws, who fail to trust him, who fail to keep the requirements that he has for us. Why is it we do that? Well, the Bible is clear that the problem is our hearts. And the problem is that our hearts have us trapped, us, have, have us trapped in sin, have us trapped in rebellion to God. Mark chapter 7 and verse 20 is Jesus describing exactly the condition of our hearts, the problem with our hearts, why we can't keep his commandments. He says in Mark 7 verse 20, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, makes them unacceptable, makes them sinful before God. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils, all these evils come from inside and defile a person. All those things in our hearts, Jesus says, those things that are in our hearts, they're what cause us to keep breaking his commands and not to trust him. They're what make us condemned before God. That's what makes us under God's judgment. We've broken his commands and deserve a penalty, deserve a judgment. We're under God's wrath. That's what brings the penalty of death to us. And ultimately hell that would be forever separated from God because we have rebelled against him, rebelled against all his ways and that sinful nature within us. We, we cannot overcome it. And so it results in us being judged by the Lord and deserving of hell. That's the condition of you and of me. That might not be that might not be good news to you, and it shouldn't be good news to you. It's bad news. Perhaps you've never realised that you are a sinner, that those things in your heart, the way you act and react and get mad and have anger and, and hatred and all those things in our heart, they're what put us under God's judgment. You see, I'm one of the worst. You know, those people around me that I love, I, I often, you know, when I'm stressed, when I'm under pressure, suddenly something 
you know, I, I, I lash out at those people around me that love me the most. And I can't really say I don't know what came over me because it comes out of me, it comes out of my heart, is what Jesus was saying. And each and every one of us has a heart that is sinful, that is against God, that cannot keep his laws perfectly. And so we are under condemnation and deserving of hell. But there is good news. There is good news that God sent his son Jesus to come. He sent him to come and to rescue us, to set us free from this law, this pattern, this habit that is of sin and that results in death. He sent Jesus to come and, and take our punishment, to take God's judgment, take his wrath upon him, upon Jesus, and to die instead of us, to die in our place. He died instead of me. He died instead of you. When he went to that cross, he took the place that should have been yours, that should have been mine. His heart was good. He was the only one who had ever trusted the Father fully, only ever loved God, only ever loved his neighbour perfectly. And yet he died there for your sin and for my sin, for your evil heart, for my evil heart. And so he died upon the cross, taking our sin to that cross, taking all God's judgment on him. And then on the third day, he was raised back to life again. The father raised him back up to life again, showing that he'd overcome sin and death. Jesus had broken this pattern of sin and death because he was made alive again. Jesus came to set us free, free from that law of sin and death. Jesus didn't come to set us free by like doing away with the law and doing away with the Ten Commandments. He didn't come to replace the, the Ten Commandments and all the laws of the Old Testament with, you know, with a simple few and, you know, or just the, and even look at the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't come to replace all the commandments with, with just the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. He didn't come to do that. No, Jesus comes to give us freedom by changing our hearts. Jesus didn't come simply to remove the disobedience of the sinful nature. But he came that we might have a new heart, that we might have his heart through his spirit in us. That we might be born again, that we might have a new life. You see, freedom is not the removal of something. Freedom for the Christian is not just the removal of something. It's not the removal of the laws. It's not even the removal of our sinful hearts. We, we have this old nature that we continue contending with. But for the Christian... Freedom is the presence of someone. It's not the removal of something, but the presence of someone. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, we read in verse 17. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If you want to be free, I want to encourage you, it's found in the presence of Jesus. It's found when his spirit is within us. That's what sets us free. We can get caught up in kind of trying to modify our behaviour. We want to be free of something. And so, you know, we kind of gone like self-discipline, self-control. We try and lock those things out of our lives. We, we, um, we, we do all kinds of things, stay away from some things, put all kinds of safeguards in place. But really what we're doing is introducing new laws into our life. But Jesus came to set us free by his very presence in us. Verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 3 says that we're to contemplate, to contemplate the glory of the Lord. And uh, I want to encourage us that that's exactly what we want to do as Christians, is to be so caught up with Jesus, contemplating him, that that's how we are free. He bought freedom for us at the cross. He set us free from the law of sin and death. And we know that in our lives, not through trying to build in more laws and change things ourselves, but by contemplating him, by knowing his presence. But when any, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. It's about keeping our eyes on Jesus. If you want to know freedom, it's about keeping your eyes on on Jesus. I wonder if you can remember the days of doing an egg and spoon race and uh, and so you'd be there at the start trying to get your hand as close to the 
um, as close to the, the egg as you could to give it plenty of balance. And um, and as the as you're under starter's orders, your eyes aren't upon where you're going to run. Your eyes aren't on the competitors or the starter, but your eyes are firmly fixed on that egg and that spoon. And as you as you hear the word to go, then you set off. And you keep your eyes firmly fixed on that egg, not on the ground in front of you, not on the competitors, not on the finish line, but you keep your eyes firm on the egg and everything else remains in the periphery. And if suddenly somebody was to fall over or they have to stop and pick up their egg, you would see them in your periphery and you would make your way around them, not taking your eyes off the egg, keeping your eyes on the egg. And so you would get to the end of the race with the egg on the spoon by keeping your eye on the egg and that steady hand. And you know, that's what the Christian life is all about. It's about keeping Jesus in the centre of your focus, keeping your eyes upon him, letting everything else become peripheral. And as you keep your eyes on him and the obstacles that come along, you'll be able to see in your periphery, he'll make you aware of, and you'll be able to go around them or over them as you keep your eyes on Jesus. He has a race marked out for you and and obstacles will come, but you keep your eyes fixed upon him. Keep your eyes fixed upon him and you will get to the end. You know, Hebrews 12 says pretty much just that. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. I want to encourage you this morning that if you want to know freedom, if you want to know freedom, then it's found in Jesus. If you're a Christian today and you want to know greater freedom, it's all about contemplating his glory, contemplating him, what he has done. The more we look at Jesus, the more we see of who he is. The greater the freedom that we have and the more like him that we become. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Run the race by fixing your eyes. Gaze upon Jesus. Can I ask you, how much have you gazed upon Jesus this week? I don't mean like spent time reading the Bible, as important as that is, and it's how we meet him. But we can just come and read scripture, come and read scripture and not meet Jesus. I don't just mean prayer, because we can come and just make petitions. But I mean actually just gazed upon Jesus, looked at his beauty, beheld his majesty, considered again the cross and what he's done for you. Just praised him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Seen him as the Lamb who is slain for you, the one who gave up his life for you. Just praised him because he is the eternal Son who's forever known the Father in the joy of the Holy Spirit. Have you have you allowed yourself just to be captivated by Jesus? Have you just been able to praise him and to worship him? Because that is where freedom is found. Is as we look upon Jesus. As we look upon him, as we are in his presence, then we are free. Because as we turn our eyes upon him, everything else falls away. Everything else falls away. We become more like him. The scripture here says um, that we're being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. The, the idea here is that we're like we're looking into a mirror. That we're seeing Jesus in a mirror, to look at Jesus like we're seeing him in a mirror. And as we're seeing him, then kind of his image becomes our image. It's like as we look upon him, we become more like him. And, and so that's what happens is the Holy Spirit comes, sets us free, makes us more like Jesus as we gaze upon him. Time just telling him how amazing he is, falling in love with Jesus, being in love with him sitting at his feet, be still and know that I am God. Jesus said to Martha, you're distracted by many things, but come and just sit at the feet of Jesus. Come and gaze upon him, gaze upon his beauty. 
gaze upon his beauty and be transformed into his likeness. It's in his likeness that we are set free. Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote elsewhere that it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Writing that we shouldn't try and set more laws for ourselves, but that we should allow ourselves to be free in Jesus. Allow his spirit to set us free. I'm going to just talk now for a couple of moments about a friend of mine as I, as I come to a close. You see, it's for freedom that we've been set free. We've been set free that we can be loved. We've been set free so that we can love. And we've been set free to be lovely as well. And so I have a, a friend called Paul. He's not somebody I knew just a year ago, and I'll keep the story brief. But uh, a year ago, Paul uh, had been through a couple of marriage breakdowns and lost family, lost everything he had, had was trying to restart again in a, a house he hated. And had pretty much just decided just to drink himself to death. And uh, I came across Paul because he called me one day. He lives in the urban area that I live in. And, uh, and he called me because he was having some experiences in his home of some spiritual experiences of things moving around and very frightening experiences. And, and I went with another elder from my church and we prayed and all of that stopped. And over the coming months, built up some relationship with Paul and was able to share the good news of Jesus with him. Paul started to read the Bible he gave his life to Jesus in a very simple way with the knowledge that he had. And over the months, he's come to trust more and more in God. You know, Paul was finding it difficult to be loved in those early days. He was ashamed of his of his alcoholism. He was ashamed of a lot of that had gone on in his life. But as time went by, as he's come to know Jesus, he's been able to accept the love of God for him. Been able to accept, accept Jesus' forgiveness, that Jesus died for him. He's been able to accept the love of a church and a family around him. And Paul is able to receive love. He's found a new love that Jesus loves him, that he's worthy of love from God. And it's amazing to see. So Paul's found a new freedom in being loved. He's also found freedom to love. A freedom, most importantly, to love God. He's found the joy of looking upon Jesus, found the joy of knowing God to be real in his experience. He's found love for God and he's known what it is to continually be, be keeping his heart loving towards Jesus. So that's in many different ways. So he, he confessed these things that he no longer steals from work like he used to do that he doesn't swear anymore. He's known God just like cleanse his heart and his mind and his mouth. And, and those words of blasphemy are no longer there. And when he hears it in others, he, it might cause him to recoil and he feels the grief that the Holy Spirit feels. He no longer looks for satisfaction in, in relationships with women and either real or online, you know, he's known what it is to be free from those things because he's free to love God and he just so enjoys his relationship with the Lord. They just want anything to come in and spoil that. A couple of weeks ago, he was watching a film and, 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 and it wasn't particularly a high certificate film, a film he'd seen before, but as he sat and watched it, he just didn't feel it was right and just felt that it was grieving the Lord. And so he switched it off. That's what it is to be free, isn't it? Free that we're free to love God as we want to love God, not, not under this law of sin and death, not, not in chain, not imprisoned, not led captive by our own hearts. And lastly, Paul's been set free to be lovely. He immediately almost developed a heart for the homeless, having had some difficult circumstances himself. And so he began to just ask friends, family for unwanted clothes and then we'd take them to a local supermarket where homeless people would be asking for money. And one day as I went with him to share the gospel with them, just witnessed him in the rain, get down on his knees and go into his bag and find some dry shoes and a coat for a homeless person. And we shared the gospel with. It was just a beautiful moment as I saw what God had done in his life just to cause him to bow the knee and serve the poor. That's our God. He takes our hard, sinful, rebellious hearts. He sets us free. In this life, we're not totally free from the sinful nature, but he sets us free by his presence in our lives, to know him, to know his love, to love others, to love him and to be lovely. God bless you.
Amen. Thanks so much, Pastor Mark. We really appreciate you spending the time with us today. And I've been so encouraged and blessed by the message and uh, stirred really to spend more quality time in the presence of Jesus so that we may experience what it means to know that freedom and that joy. Uh, let's pray. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you will help us to draw near to you and your thank you for your promise and the certainty that as we do that, you draw near to us. And Lord, in that presence and encounter with you, we may know freedom from all of the things that would otherwise cloud our minds. We would know freedom to be able to live in a way which is pleasing and honourable to you, but it actually delights our own hearts. So I pray that you'll bless us and help us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, and now for that special song. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Sari dunia ko usne thama hai. The morning day is the exhaust from the whole dunia. The tangan ya, the whole dunia, the tangan ya. Ta jang chun shi. You're 